In this video, I'm going to talk about Mercutio from Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. Um, this is just some advice on some aspects of his character that you might want to explore should Mercutio come up in your exam. Um, by no means is this everything you could say and by no means are these the only quotations that you could use. So first of all, let's look at his name because there's a lot of foreshadowing with the name Mercutio. First of all, it comes from, um, it's linked with Mercury and Mercurial. So um, with that suggests that he's unpredictable. Like the metal Mercury, it changes quickly and it responds to heat. You could link this to at three scene one, the hottest day, when Benvolio says these days is the mad blood stirring. You might argue that foreshadows um, the fact that Mercutio is going to change very suddenly. He's very light-hearted at the beginning and in that scene we'll see that he changes very quickly and challenges Tybalt um, to a duel and we all hopefully know that um, he ends up dying. So, you know, he's, he's a liability. Although he's very funny, um, we should feel nervous about Mercutio in this play um, and the kind of the trouble that he might stir. Um, it's also linked to the Roman god um, of Mercury. Um, this god was a master of words. We definitely see this with Mercutio. He's incredibly intelligent and very imaginative, especially looking at the Queen Mab's speech. Um, so that, of course, provides great entertainment for the audience. He is um, a form of, of comic relief in this, which we'll talk about later. Um, the God of Mercury was also known for his love affairs, which certainly links with Mercutio's ideas of love. Um, he certainly implies that he's very promiscuous, whether he is or isn't, we're, we're never sure, but he definitely gives off that vibe, um, which again, we'll look at um, in greater detail. So um, instantly we see that he is a loyal friend to Romeo. The first line we hear from Mercutio in Act 1, Scene 4 is, Nay, gentle Romeo, we must have you dance. So he's encouraging Romeo. Romeo, as a reminder, is um, heartbroken over Rosaline at this point. Um, so through that modal verb, must, um, we get this encouraging tone for, from him, as well as the collective pronoun, we. So we've got this sense of brotherhood. At this point, he's on stage with Romeo and Benvolio. So we get this sense that they're a really close unit and they're trying to support Romeo um, through his heartbreak. In Act 2, Scene 4, when Romeo and Mercutio are having a bit of banter and back and forth, um, he says, is this not better now than groaning for love? Now art thou Romeo. So his encouraging tone reveals he has he does have concern for Romeo's well-being, despite the fact that we see that he kind of takes the mickey out of him at times. But but deep down, he's well-meaning. He cares about Romeo's well-being. Um, it reveals to the audience that um, Romeo is much more upbeat maybe in his natural disposition than we typically see him. You know, in this play, we see that he's heartbroken, he's all moany at the beginning. And then at the end, he's, you know, head over heels in love with Juliet and, and kind of controlled by his, his emotions um, linked to women. Um, so this is one of the few times that we, we see a different side of Romeo. Um, so that's quite nice as well to see how well they... Um, they are connected and this kind of back and forth witty banter that they have shows that they really really get on um and then of course his loyalty brings takes him to his death my very friend hath got his mortal hurt in my behalf so romeo sees that mercutio died defending romeo's honor because romeo didn't want to fight tybalt so he's killed by fighting on behalf of romeo that's the ultimate sacrifice however one might argue it is mercutio's loyalty um, that leads to his tragic end you could actually argue something else that actually it's not his loyalty um it's his desire to appear masculine which we'll come to later so what about the context i see this um suggested often in, in lessons and i've seen it in exam responses before does mercutia have a crush on romeo and you can argue that for, for sure or at least um present it as a possibility but i think there are some things that you must take into consideration. Um, I'm sure many of you have um, watched 
the Baz Luhrmann take on Romeo and Juliet. That's with Leonardo DiCaprio. And the Mercutio in that um, seems very much in love with Romeo. I think it's heavily hinted that he's a homosexual um, in that take on it. But something to take into consideration that homosexuality was a capital offence in Shakespeare's England. So it's highly unlikely that Shakespeare would create a really openly homosexual character like we see in Baz Luhrmann's take um so keep that in mind if he is supposed to be homosexual it would be Shakespeare's greatest secret he would never have publicly ever said that because the audience largely would be homophobic and they would not respond to a character well if they thought he was supposed to be a homosexual because this is a very homophobic time so please bear that in mind and don't oversimplify um that suggestion you can suggest it but please don't um suggest that Mercutio is openly homosexual because he certainly isn't um, but one thing to ke- take into consideration is the way that male friendships um were kind of idealized in the elizabethan times is very different to the way we see male friendships now and so it, it's important to think about the time that it was written uh, so male friendship con- constituted a brotherhood of spiritual kind that involved notions of service and sacrifice frequently death and obviously we see that with mercutio dying you might argue um to defend romeo's honor and in comparison the love of a woman was considered sexual and therefore inferior to the love between male friends so the fact that you might see mercutio seem jealous maybe of juliet or at this time he thinks it's of rosaline um because he's losing his friend you might argue that's a really normal response and it's not it's not that he's um that he has sexual feelings for Romeo it's the fact that the expectation was that you actually considered your male friend more important than your wife um so just consider that when when offering that um suggestion um he's he's incredibly pragmatic about love um which is definitely in line you might argue with the elizabethan ideas of love at, at this time um so he you know th- this is the advice that he gives to romeo prick love for pricking and you beat love down that's in act 1 scene 4 the violent language depicts love as a battle and an act of aggression which really links if you think to his name as well he's quite volatile isn't he um ironically he is right in some respects though isn't he because Romeo and Juliet's love does end violently with suicide especially Juliet's um suicide it's particularly violent because she stabs herself so is this actually a bit more in line with um the message of the play I mean you could you could explore that possibility even if you personally don't agree with Mercutio's kind of cynical view of love um when Romeo talks about him having a dream or I'm not sure about going to this party I had this dream Mercutio basically says dreams mean nothing dreamers often lie so he's quite existentialist and that is kind of the belief that there's no such thing as fate dreams are meaningless um so he's Romeo's dramatic foil in this instance um and what we mean there is he is used to help highlight things about Romeo. And in this case, Romeo is being very superstitious. He's being really spiritual. We're not seeing that with Mercutio. Mercutio seems really quite pragmatic, which is he's kind of a man ahead of his time. And we'll, we'll come to that in a moment when we talk about context. Um It's dramatic irony, however, because actually the audience know that Romeo's dream is meaningful because it's foreshadowing his tragic fate he knows you know i had the dream and it's it's basically saying i shouldn't go to this party something's going to happen he should have listened to his dream um and then at mercutio's death he says they have made worms meet off me in contrast to romeo who says for mercutio's soul is but a little way above our heads so look at mercutio's direct you might even argue a theistic language in other words it doesn't suggest that he's he has Um, a religion or a belief in god or a belief in heaven um in contrast to romeo's spiritual language this idea of his soul rising up to the heavens already uh, shortly after his death Uh, so again we get this idea of mercutio being really quite blunt about his death death is death tomorrow i'm going to be eaten by worms i'm not going to be in heaven um in contrast to to romeo um so let's look at the the 
context here, Mercutio's existentialism is incredibly modern for the time it was written because most believe people believed in fate and a sense of inevitability and also believed in dreams, that dreams really did have a meaning and the fact that he's so dismissive of dreams. I must mention, actually, I haven't really gone into detail about Queen Mab's speech um, just because I feel like it's covered so much that and it's often used in exam answers that I feel like I, I was I'm not going to focus on something that students seem to get so well anyway. So I, I've kind of chosen um, consciously not to to go into the Queen Mab speech. Um, one thing to consider, however, is that um, we can't definitively label Shakespeare as an atheist. Okay, but we can at least say that during the time that this play was written, it was a real pivotal time in English history when long held beliefs were being held for debate. So we're starting to see, and it is a slow transition of more of a scientifically minded way. And this is kind of really early days for all of that. And actually, if you didn't believe in God, it was it was considered um, heresy. So it it's not something again that Shakespeare would have been quite open about but you know maybe Mercutio represents that change um, in mindset subtly. Um, he's bawdy in other words he's really rude okay and I'm sure these are some things that have, about Mercutio that have um, kind of stuck in your mind because some of the things that he says is really quite shocking. So when he's talking about Rosaline he refers to her quivering thigh and the domain that they're adjacent lie. So you know he's, taught, he's, he's really referring to her most intimate body parts and the fact that he focuses on her physical attributes especially her genitalia basically it reveals that his perspective of love is simply one that is sexual. And this draws parallels um, between his character and the nurse's character is also quite bawdy. Um, and it also makes him a dramatic fall again to Romeo, who experiences a much more spiritual love with Juliet. So you might argue that the whole intention of Mercutio being this way is only really to further pronounce how spiritual Romeo and Juliet's love is. So maybe that um, Shakespeare has really exaggerated this element of Mercutio's character just really to highlight how um, different Romeo and Juliet's relationship or love is. Um, in Queen Mab's speech, he does end up saying to bear making them women of good courage, talking about Queen Mab, um, basically say that it's kind of a, um, a double meaning, but he's basically saying that Queen Mab teaches women or virgins how to have sex and then of course they can they, they, they can carry children well um so in this um sense as well it reduces women to the functions of sex and childbearing and this displays a really limited appreciation for women and their worth and this is in great contrast to romeo again again this whole idea of him being a dramatic foil to romeo who addresses juliet as his equal and if not as his superior remember he refers to juliet as um a holy shrine that's something you worship um so again is shakespeare really exaggerating this kind of misogynistic um way of Mercutio really just to highlight how beautiful this relationship is and how special this relationship is between Romeo and Juliet. Um, so this can seem really offensive and it should f seem very offensive for today's world. Bearing in mind this was written um, in a patriarchal society this is Elizabethan England women were considered the lesser sex so when they're hearing these jokes and the women being reduced to to basically sexual objects um the audience wouldn't be offended they find it quite funny okay so just keep that in mind um and this is definitely evident this idea of the of the woman being the lesser sex when you think about how queen elizabeth who's ruling at this point um, was often questioned on on can is she able to really rule and that was all really based on the fact that she was a woman don't forget also the marriage process i'm sure you would have talked about this the fact that you know especially wealthier women they wouldn't have had a choice potentially of who they would marry they'd have be uh, that a dowry would be given um there'd be really their marriage was about um 
protecting the financial status of family, the social status. So really women were commodities at this time in, in, in many respects. So again, it does suggest that the audience wouldn't be looking at Makusha going, God, he's horrible. What a sexist, horrible man that actually find him quite funny and lighthearted. He's a fighter. Um, so he's he's talking about um, Tybalt in this instance when he says, ah, the immortal Posada, the punter reverse of the hay. And he's, he's, he's using all these kind of expert terminology for fencing. And that reveals that he's an experienced fencer. Um, and actually what follows this line, Benvolio goes, the what? So Benvolio clearly isn't an experienced fighter doesn't even doesn't understand the terminology that he's using and so that draws a really nice contrast between those two characters remember Benvolio's the peacekeeper isn't he in contrast to Mercutio who's the fighter the aggressor it also however draws parallels with Tybalt He's actually more like Tybalt than his his friends Romeo and Benvolio Tybalt is an aggressor as well isn't he uh, but interestingly and I feel like this is overlooked um, quite often, he is actually he he antagonizes Tybalt. Tybalt asks Mercutio for a word, and Mercutio says a word and a blow. So it's actually Mercutio who suggests they fight. Um, so he's much more antagonistic than Tybalt in this instance. His direct challenge to Tybalt. And actually the randomness of it, okay? Because Tybalt hasn't done anything to Mercutio. Tybalt doesn't want to fight Mercutio. Um, really emphasises his volatile nature. And again, we can link that to his name. And actually calls into question who is really responsible for his death. Because in the end, he blames Romeo, doesn't he? And he curses the two families and it paints himself as a victim of that feud. But, no, but Tybalt didn't want to fight Mercutio. Mercutio kind of stuck his neck into it. And remember, he's not connected to either family other than the fact that he's, he's best friends with Romeo. Um, but this really links to this, this idea of masculinity, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, and his response in watching Romeo back down from a fight, he says, vile submission. So Mercutio's disgust in Romeo's passiveness is clear in the adjective vile and his exclamatory sentence with the use of the exclamation mark. He clearly believes that a man's honour depends on his ability to meet violence with violence. And you can certainly say that's um, in line with the ideas of masculinity of the time. So first of all, looking at fencing, fencing was a very fashionable sport at the time that this was written. So this is the late 1500s, about 1596. Um, so first of all, the actor playing Mercutio would have to be a talented fencer to be convincing enough for the audience. Um, but it also shows that Mercutio, through even his fight, is a form of entertainment for the audience again, okay? They would really appreciate seeing a really well choreographed fight um, because it was such a popular sport. Um, and this, you might argue, is really in line. There's nothing that shocking on the stage, potentially, for the Elizabethan audience because street fights were common. So 90% of homicides had a male defendant and 80% had a male victim. So male-on-male -male crime was, was very high. And men were expected to be violent in order to, to defend their honour. Um, so you might argue there's nothing that shocking here um, with regards to Mercutio and Tybalt's um, fight. But of course, he's a tragic fi figure because he dies at the beginning of Act 3. Um, look at the way that he responds initially to his, um, to his wound, which obviously is deep enough to kill him. He refers to it as a scratch, a scratch. This is called meiosis. It's the opposite of a hyperbole, basically. It's when you belittle something rather than exaggerate. So he belittles his wound showing that even to the very end, he's conforming to these masculine ideals, okay? He doesn't want to show that he's hurt, he's downplaying it. Um, so again, you can say he's, he's, his tr part of his tragedy is that he wants to conform to this kind of masculine ideal and that's what his downfall is. Um, he's, even, he's even making jokes towards the end so he says you will fight tomorrow you will find me a grave man so the use of pun here that being grave not only indicates that Mercutio will be dead because he'll be in a grave but also that he'll be more serious a grave man is a serious man 
that actually also indicates the turning point of the play because you can argue that the first two acts of this play um, are more like a comedy especially with Mercutio but even Romeo the way that he kind of moans and um, that depicts this kind of Petrarchan lover that would be actually quite comedic for the audience at the time so the first two acts are comedy and we have this very swift change to three acts of tragedy and this is a real turning point because he's saying tomorrow I'm going to be serious tomorrow I'm no longer going to be Mr Comedy Um, and we see that in his final words a plague on both your houses ironically Mercutio is extremely bitter in his final words which obviously serves as a contrast to this comedic figure that he's been um, at the beginning of the play And that contrast draws attention to his words that indicate the turning point in the play, that being that it's gone from a comedy to a tragedy. And of course it foreshadows um, what will happen. Um, You know, the plague is going to be the suicides of Romeo and Juliet. You can even link it to the fact that the message that's supposed to get to Romeo um, doesn't get to Romeo because there's a plague. And remember, I haven't put this in here, but the Elizabethan audience would be very superstitious. They might actually believe that Mercutio did actually create this curse and therefore create a a plague that stopped the message getting to Romeo. That's something that you could definitely explore. So in all of this, you have to think about why a character is created to get those top marks and really think about why did Shakespeare create that character? For what reason? For what function? And there's a few things I'd say for Mercutio. He's comic relief, for sure, okay? When we first meet him, um, he's mocking Romeo, telling him to borrow Cupid's wing, soar with them above a common bound. And that really sums up him as a character and the function of his character of one of comic relief. He's trying to lighten what is a really heavy mood created by Romeo. And that's a very that's very much needed in this tragedy. We need those moments of relief and um Macbeth, uh, Macbeth sorry Mercutio really offers that relief to the um, audience the lessons to learn through him first of all through his death this reminds us of the core of choruses um, the choruses foreshadowing that civil hands make civil blood unclean um, this emphasizes how feuds affect the wider public they affect innocent lives and not only Mercutio's life but of course we're going to see the death of Romeo and Juliet and that's all linked to the the feud it's all been created by that feud um Mercutio is also an example of an extreme character in in his in his personality okay think about how volatile he's been um just as Romeo and Juliet in a different way that but they're very extreme in the way that they love um so it could be argued that Shakespeare uses Mercutio's character to encourage the audience to seek moderation in in every way so Romeo and Juliet he uses them to say seek moderation in the way you love maybe he's saying with with Mercutio seek moderation in the in the way that you think you should be as a man seek moderation in the way that you are violent okay or you handle feuds Um, but he's also of course a dramatic fool which we've talked about a lot he's used to really pronounce the spirituality of Romeo and Juliet's love as well um as always there's there's lots of different ways that you can talk about Ro- uh, mercutio um and i didn't really talk about queen mab's speech you could, there's lots there as well would love for you to share your ideas in the comment section but hopefully that's given you some different ideas that you could include in um, an exam response <laughs>